very much. It's a great pleasure to be here to speak to you about some work that we're doing now that really has the genesis of work we've been doing for the last uh, 30 years. And as Mike mentioned, a big part of my life over the last 10 or 15 years has been involved in a project called the Global Burden of Disease. It's a, a, a project funded by the uh, Bill, uh, Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation. And what the uh, purpose of the project is really is to assist countries around the world, mostly in um, uh, sort of developing countries, underdeveloped countries, and try to understand what risks those citizens of those countries are exposed to. So about smoking, about drinking water, about diet, about malaria, cholera, and things like that. And the idea of the project was to do a comparative risk assessment but by evaluating every risk factor and every exposure and using exactly the same methodology. And so yesterday I talked a little bit about um, the role that uh, I've been playing in one of the risk factors, which is outdoor air pollution, on a global scale. But the talk I'm going to give today is going to be just the opposite. Is going to say, because right now, global burden of disease makes estimates for every country in the world including the United States, and in some cases, like the United States, they do sub-regional estimates. So they do about, I think, eight or nine different regions in the U.S. And they publish those in the Lancet every single year. So every single year, just 2016 came out a couple of months ago in the Lancet. And countries are now using that information to make decisions to prioritize about the different risk factors in their country and which ones they should focus on um, immediately or, or later on. However, when we... Just because you want to get the video, sorry. So whenever we look at this for a place like Canada, we find that the, the work that we do in Canada and the work that's done for the global burden ends up being quite different. And so we decided that we would uh, set up our own burden of disease program I call it a local burden of disease program. And in that program, in, in the global burden program, we evaluate studies from all over the world. So we do literature analysis and meta-analysis and so on. But there are a lot of interesting pollutant combinations, exposure profiles, health profiles in any given country that maybe such a global assessment may not be appropriate. So I'm going to talk about how we do this local burden of disease uh, design and possibly uh, where there's some opportunities for places like the United States to do similar things. Well, I'm going to start out with a, a famous, one of the most famous slides in air pollution epidemiology. And uh, have any of you heard about the famous London fogs of the 1950s and 1960s? These were episodes a lot of coal is, is burnt in London in those days for heating and cooking. And the, uh, we have temperature inversions, air mass stag and air masses, levels get very high. And this was the pattern uh, in one of these episodes where we have, uh, is there a pointer working? Nope. How about can't see it? No? Uh, okay, I'm going to just blew something there. Okay. There you go. So it's this one. Okay. Oh, it's this one. Okay. So let's get rid of that. Get rid of this. So this is the this is the level of particulate matter over about a one week period in London in early December. This is what is for 1962. And particulate levels were going from about 200 micrograms per meter cube all the way up to about 2,000, 
And the number of deaths in London every day is around 250, and that dramatically grows up to almost double, almost 500 deaths, and then they gradually go down. And so this actually was a wake-up call for many countries around the world to say, you know, this air pollution is toxic, it's a public health problem, and uh, countries such as Canada and the United States have reduced our levels. These are different measures of particulate pollution starting in 1970, total suspended particles, uh, PM10 and PM2.5, little smaller size fractions, and levels have been gradually going down over time, year after year. This is a picture of Toronto on a smoggy day in Toronto, and this is the pattern that we see even at much lower levels. So we see a pattern of pollution going up for about a three-day episode, and now we're going from about 18 to about 32 micrograms. Remember in the London fog it was around 2,000. But here what we're seeing is again an increase in mortality and then going back down. So even at these very, very low levels, we were seeing effects of air pollution on mortality. Well, one of the most important studies that was ever done on this is called the Six City Study. This was a study uh, conducted at the Harvard School of Public Health. And they looked at six small communities that transacted the Appalachian Mountains, all the way from Watertown, uh, Massachusetts, to Topeka, Kansas. And they, the mortality rates in these six cities are plotted here. And you can see as the levels of pollution increase, down from about 10 micrograms to about 30, you can see that the relative risk of, of, of all-cause mortality went up. And in fact, the United States EPA set the first national ambient air quality standard for long-term exposure to fine particulate matter in 1997 uh, based on this study and this graph. Well, there was another major study that we did, and Mike, Jarrett, and I were in heavily involved in this study. It was called the American Cancer Society Study. And it was a study of about a million uh, U.S. citizens that were interviewed by the American Cancer Society in 1982. And they've been followed for about 30 years in terms of their vital status. So when did they die? What did they die of? And this is a map that uh, Mike created um, maybe 20 years ago. 18. 18. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a map of particulate sulfate, which is one component of particles. And the dark area is high level. So you can see that sort of a mountain of pollution in the Ohio Valley. And this was back in the 1980s. And then if we looked at the more excess mortality rates after controlling for smoking, body mass index, diet, and everything else in the cohort, that we also saw sort of a large mountain of excess mortality. And so there was a very clear association in that cohort between uh, living in a community with higher pollution and not living as long. So the what has happened is that when we look at the dose response model of the American Cancer Society cohort, we see a fairly linear dose response association and then a slight curvature at the top. But the data that we have in here was the lowest exposure in this plot is about seven micrograms per meter cubed. Now you think seven micrograms per meter cubed is very small and very low, um, and in fact, the because of this study, the US EPA in, in 2015 established a new national ambient air quality standard of 12. So the six city study sort of was the main evidence to suggest a standard of 15 micrograms per meter cubed. And the American Cancer Society study was one of the main studies used by the EPA to reduce that level to 12. However, for Canada, 65% of Canadians live in areas below this concentration. So here's a, a situation for us in Canada. What do we do in areas where we have many of our subjects uh, and, and citizens living in this kind of area? Do we assume that there's no exposure response in that area? 
and give no benefits to redu reductions there, or do we have to actually fill up knowledge in this lower area? Now, what we do in Canada, and what we also do in the United States and many countries, is we evaluate the efficacy of any reduction in pollution with a cost-benefit analysis. And the cost-benefit analysis basically takes, this is an example of uh, reducing sulfur content in gasoline, it takes uh, proposed reductions in the sulfur content in gasoline, models what the difference in the emissions out of a tailpipe would be, how those emission changes would change ambient concentrations, how they would affect our actual personal exposure, how those personal exposure changes would affect our health, and then we monitorize those health benefits. And for instance, um, the value of a statistical life, one excess death avoided, is uh, monitorized from about four to ten million dollars. And that's why uh, the mortality studies are usually the main drivers and the main areas of controversy in these benefits analysis. However, when we get down to very low levels, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in what the shape of the dose response curve looks like. So, in the global burden of disease, where we're doing this kind of thing for every country in the world, and the American Cancer Society cohort was a main uh, piece of, of evidence that we used in the global burden, we see that we can model PM 2.5 concentrations all over the world, so North America is fairly low, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa is high, mainly because of dust raising, you can see now all the stories coming out of China, where China has very, very high levels. And the global burden was suggesting in 2010 that 3.2 million excess deaths and 76 million disability adjusted life years were due to um, air pollution. And air pollution was ranked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 out of all the different risk factors. So dietary risks, high blood pressure, smoking, uh, household pollution, body mass index, and so on were ranked higher. GBD now estimates, in its recent 2015 estimates, that 7,000 excess deaths in Canada are due to fine particulate exposure. One of the problems for us is Health Canada, the organization I work for, estimates that 14,000 excess deaths are due to PM2.5 exposure. So we wanted to get into, to try to understand why these kind of differences were occurring, and the suggestion that maybe only relying on the global burden of disease estimates for a particular region, location, or country may not give us the full picture of the public health impact. So, we wanted to, to start this out with kind of a new paradigm of thinking. The science driven by policy needs. So, there's a knowledge acquisition phase which runs along on time, and this is what most of us do. We do basic science, we do interesting experiments, we test hypotheses, we write beautiful papers and important journals, um, and we uh, acquire knowledge. And there's a knowledge implementation phase, is what regulators and risk assessors and policymakers do, and they run along the time in a parallel time frame. And they want to do, and they want to use that basic science to make, develop policy. And the normal thing in the knowledge transition, translation phase is that information from the basic science goes into the policy analyses. Now, both Mike and I have experienced this a number of times where regulatory agencies will call us up and will say, you know, we really like this paper and we want to use it as a, a main uh, knowledge point in a policy development, but the way you've reported things in the paper isn't quite what we want, right? And how about if we changed it like this and we did this with it and we did that with it? And I think Mike and I would both say, well, no, I don't think that really makes sense. Why don't you just fund us to do and collect the information that you want and you need in your policy development? So what we want to do is we want to have this circular 
translation of knowledge. We want to have, we want to do good basic science. We don't want to do poor science just for policy analysis. But we do, if we can, we want to design epidemiological studies. We want to analyze those studies in a way that are most useful for policy analysis. So the way that we do that is and the way that we do policy analysis uh, um, these days is we start out with some policy questions. Policy questions about combustion sources and of course in the era of climate change, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how they're going to affect uh, uh, ambient concentrations in human health. And most of these things are generated through something called a chemical transport model. And a chemical transport model is basically you know, thousands of differential equations that convert emissions of pollution into deposition, into ambient concentrations. And what people can do is they can tweak things. They can go in and they can say, if I reduce uh, nitrogen dioxide emissions from a tailpipe by 10%, how's that going to change ambient concentrations of nitrogen dioxide? And some of that is converted to particulate matter and the more nitrogen dioxide I have, and the more ground level ozone I have. And so you can see that these models are very complicated and they involve multiple pollutants. And hopefully, there, as time goes on and emissions inventories get more reliable and computing power gets stronger, these models go down on a fine spatial scale. And uh, we've been starting to run models originally at about a 250 kilometer grid, and now they're running them at about a four kilometer grid, right? So they're getting down very, very uh, fine spatial scale. And that produces an exposure assessment, which fits into a, a sort of a very complex model of exposure assessment. And the ones that we're doing in Canada are the basic things, fine particulate matter, NO2 and ozone, the components of PM, so carbon, organic matter, dust, uh, sulfate, nitrate, and so on. And then we're doing a lot of other things like on oxidative potential and reactive oxygen species, ultrafine particles. These are all different characteristics of, of particulate matter that we're interested in. And then what we want to do is we wanted to develop Canadian-based health impact functions, which are going to convert those changes in atmospheric levels into some kind of health impact. But they're going to be based on information in Canada. Because the pollutant mixtures in Canada can be different than other countries around the world. Um, the, the nature of the individuals and the uh, demographics in Canada can be different. And obviously, the shape of the dose response if it's non-linear and we have low levels, then maybe what is being observed in other countries isn't appropriate for Canada. And then what we'd like to do is estimate the burden of all the different health outcomes uh, based on disability adjusted life years. So I can take, um, you know, exacerbation of asthma, I can take uh, development of cancer in children, uh, de uh, development of dementia, uh, in, in older people and a loss in life expectancy all on a single scale. And what I want is, I want this across the entire lifespan. Because air pollution affects us in utero and until the very day we die. So the first thing we want to do is we want to build exposure models. And we do this by a combination of information that have to do with industrial emissions inventories. Uh, we have satellite measurements. Uh, you know, probably most of you know about all the wonderful work that NASA is doing and setting up satellites and doing um, uh, retrievals of information all over the globe. We have chemical transport models which interact with that. We have land use information, uh, how many the traffic counts, how close you live to major roads or parks and we have ground monitoring data. And we put that all together in models. And here's a model of fine particulate matter for Canada. So you can see this is a very vast country. Um, I'm not sure where this is down here, but okay, some <laughs> vast wilderness, I guess. Um, <laughs> it looks like the reverse of a weather channel map where there's just this big gray blob above the 48 states. <laughs> Well, it's just all your perspective, right? 
Okay, so this is fine particulate matter. The green is obviously low levels, so you can see that there's a lot of green on this map of very, very low levels, like two to four, zero to four uh, micrograms per meter cubed. And then you got the major cities, you got southern Ontario, which is a little higher levels, and you've got the major cities, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. You can see higher levels in the cities. Uh, Montreal, Ottawa, uh, Toronto, um, Southern Ontario. So basically, people that live in major cities have more pollution. Uh, this is a map for a ground level ozone. So we can see in here that uh, this is the Edmonton, uh, Calgary area. So you can see a lot of the uh, refining and um, uh, industrial activity in that area because of, of oil and that it's, it's creating uh, uh, higher ozone levels and you can see this very high area of ozone in southern Ontario and this is an area for uh, nitrogen dioxide and this is um, so all of these points this is actually a land use regression model which estimates exposure at particular lat longs and this is actually all of these points are places where Canadians actually live. So you can see the, uh, the interior of Newfoundland, not a lot of people live. <laughs> and obviously in the northern provinces. Um, and you can see a lot of the uh, oil refining capabilities around the uh, Edmonton. And up in here you can see a little bit of, of the uh, oil sands uh, activity. Uh, another surfaces that we develop, this is uh, for different uh, transition metals. This is the uh, city of Toronto. This is for copper. Uh, you can see the major roadways. This is the 401, uh, the Don Valley Expressway, uh, iron. And this is the reactive oxygen species, which is a, a mathematical model, which is generated from a lot of inputs, mainly copper and iron. And one of the interesting things here is you see these are two major rail yards. So you can see a lot of the metals being generated from those rail yards. So the studies that we are proposing and, and we are actually developed so far are cradle to grave. So we have national data sets on birth outcomes. So every birth in the country is uh, quite a bit of information is recorded on the individual and we can link that with uh, all the different air pollution uh, surfaces that we're interested in. We have studies on childhood de development of asthma um, and childhood cancer. We have studies on, which I'll just explain in a little bit more detail how we do those, but studies on adults, uh, development of asthma, hypertension, diabetes, cancer incidence, coronary events, stroke, COPD, and a lot of the new work we're doing now on um, the development of dementia. And we had a paper published recently in The Lancet um, in which we showed that the closer you live to a major highway, the higher risk you had of developing dementia. And it got a lot of world press and, and cartoonists would come out in all the different newspapers and they'd have people with a, like a road behind them and they're like shaking their head and sort of going like this and what, sort of nuts. They were making sort of a lot of jokes out of it. But it's sort of an interesting thing because obviously when you get into, um, you know, because most of the focus of our work is in work around the world has been on mortality, but I think the um, central nervous system, we're doing things like dementia, we're doing Parkinson's, we're doing multiple sclerosis. So basically what we'd like to do is have studies that are Canadian specific, that are of national coverage, that are dealing with every life cycle uh, all together. And what we like to do is we like to analyze these studies all using the exact same exposure information, exact same uh, statistical methodology, dose response modeling, and so on. So we have now a complete picture from birth to death. Okay, so one of the first studies that I want to talk about is the Canadian Census Health and Environment Cohort. So, um, has anybody filled out the long form census here? You yeah, have? So it's a long form, right? So lots of questions. We have a census in Canada every five years, and one in five households get the long form. 
and it's a systematic sample. So they, they label houses one, two, three, four, five, and if it's this year, house three gets sampled, then every house three gets sampled. And it's a, it's a very long form, and they ask a, a lot of um, information about your occupation, your education, your marital status, your religion, um, you know, where you work, how you get to work, uh, you know, all kinds of things. And so what we did is we started out with the 1991 long form, and we linked about two and a half million respondents in the long form to their vital status for 20 years, up to 2011, and we're just about to complete another five-year uh, linkage. So for these people now, we know who died, when they died, and what they died of. And one of the interesting things that we've added on to this is not only the underlying cause of death on the death certificate, but all mentions on the death certificate. So that gives us a lot more information about other diseases that that individual had. Then what we've done is we've linked these individuals to our cancer incidence database. The database starts in 1969, and this linkage so far is up to 2010, and we're doing another five-year linkage. So we can go back to 1969, and, and uh, starting in 1991, for instance, we can identify all those subjects that have had any kind of cancer identified, remove them from the cohort, and start with a cancer non, I shouldn't say cancer free, they could have cancer, but they haven't been diagnosed, and we can then follow them for 20 or 30 years. And so we can look at the effects of environmental uh, contaminants on cancer incidence. But the, one of the most important things that we have to do is, in these studies is we have to know where you live. So when you, you give your address on the 1991 long form, but we don't know where you live in the subsequent years. So what we've done, and maybe this is something that I know that when I've given these talks to other uh, American colleagues that they say you could absolutely possibly not do this in the United States, but what we've done is we've linked these individuals to their income tax returns. <laughs> and we've linked them back from, to starting in 1981 to, uh, well, this is 2011, and we're going to do some more linkage. And from the income tax returns, we know your home address. In fact, we, we know your home address, what we know is your home address postal code. And the postal code in Canada is a much smaller geographic area than a zip code. It basically is a city block. So it might be 15, 10 or 15 households. So it's a very small area. I'm just wondering, could you help us to get President Trump's uh, tax returns? Sure, okay. <laughs> we could link that to all kinds of things. Eh? <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> So the interesting part about this is now, for 30 years, we can identify where individuals lived, where they moved. So you can do interesting studies with this. You can do mover studies. You can say, well, let's say you spent some time in a low pollution environment, you move to a high. Or you were in a high pollution environment, you move to a low pollution environment. Then what we also did is we have, Nash, just like you do in the United States, we have national health surveys. And we survey about 100,000 people a year. Uh, we started the surveys in 2001, um, and of course in those surveys we ask all kinds of additional questions. In the long form they ask a lot of questions, but they don't ask about smoking, they don't ask about diet, they don't ask about BMI. And I'm going to show you in a minute how we integrate information from these health surveys to help us understand the risk factors in, in the subjects in, in the long form. And in addition, what we did is we linked the health survey rep, uh, respondents to their mortality. So there's a lot of linkage going on here. And this is actually a new environment because uh, st this is all done within Statistics Canada. And previously, they would not link anything to the census. Absolutely nothing. It was verboten. And now they've really changed their attitude. I don't know whether they feel they have nice products here that they can sell and make money on <laughs> or whatever, but there's a completely different opening up of linking these databases together. So now what we have is a cohort of several million people followed for 20 or 30 years with 
individual annual residence information and a whole suite of cohorts or a whole suite of risk factors. And but we didn't want to stop there. So we decided what we do is there's the 91 um, long form respondents and then we did the 96 and then we did the 2001 and then we did the 2006 and eventually we'll do the 2011 and so on. And for these four different cohorts, that represents over half the adult population of Canada. So we have, you know, uh, about 10 million, 12 million subjects in these cohorts now, uh, followed up over a long time. So there is one of the important health endpoints for mortality and cancer incidence where we can have national coverage. Now, what are some of the results of this? This is the relationship between PM2.5 exposure and uh, non-accidental mortality in the uh, CANCHEC cohorts. And you can see where we had information only at about to seven with the ACS study, we now see what the curve looks like down at much lower levels. And we see that we can see that there's effects down, right down to zero, no evidence of a threshold. So now we're, for the first time, anywhere in the world actually, we're able to see what this dose response looks like at these low levels. Now, for the Global Burden of Disease Program, in 2010, we created what's called a counterfactual uncertainty distribution. And that is an interval of exposure where we were unsure that there would be any association. And our initial estimates of 3.2 million deaths and 76 million dallies were based on that uncertainty interval. 89% of Canadians live below that level. In 2015, based on some studies done around the world, but mostly on a number of Canadian cohort studies, the Global Burden Program decided to lower this uncertainty level, and we ended up with 4.2 million deaths globally and 100 million deaths. So now the current uncertainty level is saying, well, we really think there's an association above this level. We really are don't think there's any association below this level and we're uncertain in, in the middle. But at least only 1% of Canadians live below this level. So now we're getting down to the global burden analysis saying, okay, it's actually being sort of more meaningful uh, to Canada, although we definitely see associations uh, at, at very low levels here. These are some of the dose responses that we can do I showed you three maps, one for PM, one for ozone, and one for uh, nitrogen dioxide. And these are what the dose response is. This is a joint model, a three pollutant model. So all of these pollutants are controlling for each other. And we see a super linear, sort of linear tailing off a bit for PM. We see a very different dose response for ground level ozone. So a clear threshold and then going up. In nitrogen dioxide, we see a very strong superlinear association. So now we're able to get multiple pollutant nonlinear models, um, and we can base those because we have such huge sample sizes uh, in these cohorts. Now, I showed you a picture of iron and copper um, land use regression surfaces and reactive oxygen species predictions from those. And it's sort of interesting, this is for Toronto, these are wintertime levels of ROS, these are summertime levels, and you can see the actual, and this is the relationship with PM2.5, and you can see that this is quite log linear. You can see that for very small changes in PM2.5, you're getting very, much, much larger changes in ROS, and at the very top, you're not getting any change at all. So. One well, of the next projects we're going to do is we're going to relate these ROS predictions to mortality to see if the ROS curve is going to be actually much more linear. That is, the PM2.5 mass is an indicator of pollution and an indicator of toxicity, but it may not be the most appropriate indicator in every location. Now, here's something that we had a little fun to do with is 
we added these curves that I showed you into a calculator. It's called the Big Life Calculator. So if you get on your phones and you Google Big Life, you'll, it comes up. And you can put in, so what it does is you put in all the information about your diet and your health and everything like this. And so I just turned on Sunday, it was my birthday, and I turned 63 years old. And I put in all the information about uh, myself in here, and it says I'm going to live to be almost 93. It thinks I have a health age of equivalent of 51. Now, I might have cheated a little bit because I did put in every glass of wine I drank as a serving of fruit. <laughs> So I don't know if that skewed things very much, okay. <laughs> I think it was legitimate. So here's an indication of, so I did this for three different places in Canada. Victoria, so it's on the west coast, and I took a location that was um, at, in a golf course, basically. So it says very low pollution levels, and it says that I, my, I have no loss in life expectancy of living at a golf course in Victoria. If I go to Ottawa and I put in my home address where I live in Ottawa, it says that I have 0.7 years of loss of life expectancy because of the pollution in Ottawa. And if I go to Toronto and I pretend that I'm living in a multi-million dollar condo next to the Gardner Expressway, so I'm very wealthy and I'm very well educated, but because I live next to a, very, a, a, a highway with a lot of traffic, I'm going to lose 1.6 years of life of loss expectancy. Now this is a curve, of, remember I was talking about the birth to death, this is an analysis we did with uh, nitrogen dioxide and low birth weight across the entire country and this is what the dose response curve, so it's a very S-shaped curve. This is loss um, of uh, uh, birth weight in uh, grams and you can see that at higher levels of nitrogen dioxide babies are born uh, that are a little lighter. So we can see a clear clear dose response pattern with um, uh, at least one birth outcome. Now the other studies we did, now you know Bernie Sanders has been talking a lot about Canadian healthcare. And one of the advantages of having a single payer healthcare system is that we can collate every interaction that you have with the healthcare system. That information is kept at a central registry in each province of Canada. So every time you see a doctor, every time you get a drug prescription, every time you go to the hospital, have any kind of procedure at a clinic, that information is um, obtained on you and it is, and we can follow you from birth to death on every interaction of the healthcare system. And, and what we're using that for, so what it's mostly used for is, you know, are there higher rates of certain operations in certain parts of the country and why that is, you know, and it, they really use it for healthcare management to understand what's really going on in the system, um, bad drug interactions and, and things like that. But what we're using it for is we're creating a whole series of cohorts of individuals. The system starts in 1991 and we can create cohorts of individuals based on getting, uh, integrating all of these different databases together about their drug claims, their physician claims, their, uh, this is the national ambulatory system, so this is, um, um, you know, ambulances, hospital discharges, and so on, and we can create a whole series of cohorts based on different outcomes. And the outcomes so far, we've created our hypertension, myocardial infarction, conjunctive heart failure, diabetes, dementia, Parkinson's, uh, and multiple sclerosis. We've also done acute myocardial infarctions and strokes. We've done about 10 different outcomes. And so what we do is we create algorithms of combinations of healthcare billing outcomes that we think are going to predict whether you have diabetes or not. And so in diabetes, we have either one hospital admission with diabetes, or an OHIP claim followed within two years by either an OHIP claim, OHIP is the Ontario Health Insurance Program, or a hospital admission with diabetes or something like that. So we have these different combinations and you can see that the specificity 
And so what, every time they produce an algorithm, they go in and they do an independent uh, record check of hospital records and physician records, and they say, you know, do we think that that person had diabetes from the basic records? And then they compare it with the algorithm prediction. And the, the specificity says, the algorithm says yes, and the um, independent assessment says yes in about 99, 100%, 97, 97, 93. So basically, if the algorithm says you have an outcome, the independent assessment says you have an outcome. The problem with healthcare billing data is that it's, a physician may put down the code that they remember best. If you come in and, and the physician thinks you have high blood pressure, um, but doesn't treat you for high blood pressure, doesn't do any prescription for that, and doesn't put a code in, so that visit was a general checkup or something with not high blood pressure, then they're going to miss you. And you can see the sensitivity of some of these is much lower, right? Um, this is the dose response that we had for strokes. So this is a stroke, so this is the uh, incidence of stroke and PM 2.5, it's pretty linear, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, this is OX, which is the redox potential of ozone and NO2, and here it is for um, uh, 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 fibrillations, uh, the, so you have, a, again, a bunch of different dose responses. So basically we're going to run through and do all of these outcomes in this manner. Here's AMIs, same type of thing. Now, I'm just going to put one equation on here. And the reason I'm going to do this is because in a lot of these large databases, especially in the healthcare billing database, you know, we have your age, we have your sex, we have where you live every year. Uh, we have all your comorbidities, obviously, because of the healthcare, but we don't have things on smoking and education and income. And so we've developed methods called indirect adjustment where we take the hazard ratio that we get from the cohort and we alter it in a certain way. There's too many equations, but basically based on information that we get from our health surveys. So we look at the relationship between air pollution and smoking in the health survey and we can alter what we find in the population data to get a, an indirect adjustment method there. And so this is a way that we can actually use these big national population health databases yet control for missing risk factors. Yeah. Okay, and that's for the Canadian community. So basically what we have here is we're trying to think of a new kind of design. We have health surveys with only, let's say, a few hundred thousand people. They have a lot of information on them, but not, a few hundred thousand is not a lot of people in this kind of area. Then we have long-form census, and then we have population data. We, can, we link all of these through locational tax information, and then we link them all through a consistent exposure assessment. And these are the people that are involved in the different projects that we have in here. So every person is working on a different aspect. And I'll just finish up by saying that my philosophy is the relationship between science and policy is good science may or may not lead to good policy. But bad science, I think, always leads to bad policy. Thank you. Well, we all, we do, and, and, well, obviously we include temperature in two ways. We do sort of time series studies where we looked at daily hospital admissions or daily deaths correlated with daily air pollution and temperature. So we obviously put temperature in there. In all of these studies, we're really looking at spatial variation. So if you live in a community of high pollution, do you not live as long? Do you have higher incidence of disease? We look at temperature there. We've also built climate zone models. So we've patched up the entire country into about eight different climate zones. 
and then we're looking at the effect of climate zone on health. So that's another factor. We also look at green space, blue space. <laughs> another, uh, uh, so you had a, a, a slide that had a map of ROS right. um, in the street from iron, copper, and then um, yeah. uh, Are those modeled or yeah. those filter measurements? No, they're not filter measurements. Th that's an actual uh, toxicological mathematical model. That's based on filter measurements yeah. of copper and Right. Okay. Right. But we are doing campaigns where we will do filter measurements uh, to try to verify the surface. But. Doctor, you and I will be doing the same thing. Yeah. Doctor, yeah. Uh, Brian, my yeah. So you you have this longitudinal uh, study where you've actually recorded where people are at, and I am guessing I've gone back to. Uh, ambient air estimates. Um, and, and so you have a, a long series of exposure rather than assuming a point in time and, and basically assuming current exposure is the same as past exposure. Right. How does that change your estimates vis-a-vis -vis other estimates that use this more traditional shortcut? Okay, well, we haven't, we've just completed a project on what we call backcasting. So backcasting, so unfortunately all the remote sensing data from satellites, most of the intense ground monitoring data, the land use data, is all better available after 2000. So we've been using chemical transport models and limited amount of ground data, weather data, to backcast to 81. And so our plan is to look at exposure time window analysis in there. Well, we've done a little bit of that, and, and other people, uh, like the Harvard School of Public Health and the Nurses' Health Study has done some of that. They, when people have done that, they've tended to find that more recent exposures are more important or better predictors. Uh, the only caveat I have in that is the more recent exposures have a better data support. So I don't know whether it's data support or, or not. But we have a project funded by the Health Effects Institute to specifically try to go back and look at the exposure time window. So we do have mobility. The, the difficulty is that once you get to about 50, your mobility rates go down. And so that's when you're getting a higher number, really after 65, the number of deaths. So, you know, the, the ability, and you're always being exposed. It's not like an occupational study where you have like virtually no exposure. You come in and you get a walk, tons of benzene exposure for three years, and then you move on to another place and you get nothing, right? So you're getting these gradual declines in exposure or changes in exposure. So, you know, we're going to do it. And, and that, but we found, uh, we found, tried to do some of that in the ACS cohort in California and it hasn't been very fruitful. Uh, the, the concentrations over time are just very correlated with each other. Yeah. So it, it's, we, we we're, we're, we're going to try it, but I'm not sort of convinced if we're going to really be able to differentiate one exposure time window from another. Let me thank uh, Dr. Yeah.